All right, so over the past uh, four weeks, in conjunction with all of the stories and things that we've told the uh, kids this past week, which was incredible, by the way, 204 kids coming through the door, seven getting saved, that's awesome, right? That makes for a a, a great week. But we've been teaching along with uh, what we taught them, and we have covered some of the most incredible stories that you can find in the entire Bible, and they all communicate this similar theme, the fact that you and I are chosen by God as his treasured possession. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 has been our memory verse for this particular series, and I hope that uh, by now it's sort of embedded into your mind, even though I didn't mention it last week. It's there in your notes, but it says this. It says, you are a people holy to the Lord your God, for the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his treasured possession. What an incredible truth. And as we've seen throughout this series, that truth has been communicated to us by God himself in various ways. His intimate knowledge of the details of our life, the fact that when we pray, That not only does God hear us, but He answers our prayers. He comforts us and forgives us whenever it is that we need it. And then the story we're going to look at today is just going to be absolutely incredible. Even though it's the last story in the series, it's in no way least among them. It's one of the most gripping, in my opinion, most gripping narratives in the entire Bible. And here's something interesting about it. God is not mentioned even once. I'm talking about none other than the Old Testament book and story of Esther. And even though God isn't mentioned in this book and in this story, His presence, the way God is working and and intervening in the events and the people's lives and just arranging things, is absolutely undeniable. And just as a side note, uh, sort of to add to your catalog of Bible knowledge, there's only one other book in the Bible that doesn't mention God by name. You have the book of Esther and Song of Solomon. And here's something interesting about both of those. They both communicate a very similar message. It's the one that we're focusing on this morning That God chooses you. God has chosen me. In the the book of Song of Solomon, we have God being depicted in the male figure in the story. Who we believe to actually be King Solomon himself. And he chooses the Shunammite woman to be his bride. Despite the fact that she has a a low self-esteem. A low self-worth. We see that she has a lack of confidence, but he overrides all of that and chooses her for himself. In the story of Esther, again, this truth is personified in the divine arrangement of people and events that would ultimately lead Esther to be the one to not only save herself, but her entire people, the Jewish people, from sure annihilation. So if you've never read the book of Esther, I want to challenge you to take time to read it this week. It's not very long. It's 10 chapters, just over 5,600 words, which means that your average adult, you should be able to sit down and read the story of Esther from beginning to end in about 30 or 45 minutes. That's not too much to ask. You could do that one morning before you go to work, One evening before you go to bed, just sit down and spend some time in God's Word and read the story of Esther from start to finish. But obviously, whether you've ever read it or not, I'm going to give you somewhat of a a short narrated version of the events of the story of Esther this morning so that we can all leave here at least on the same page and having some understanding and be familiar with uh, what takes place. But before we do... In the story, we need to familiarize ourselves and be introduced to the five main characters. All right, so let's meet the first one. 
The first main character in the story of Esther is a king named Ahasuerus. He also goes by the name Xerxes. King Ahasuerus, called Xerxes. And we meet the king in the first few verses in the first chapter of the book of Esther. And this also sets for us a time period for the events that occur during the story of Esther. And it starts this way, Esther chapter 1, starting in verse 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Cush. Cush is the northern Nile region. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. So history confirms for us that King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, who is also the father of King Darius that you meet in the book of Daniel, and Daniel gets thrown into the, to the den of lions. So this is his father. He ruled the Persian Empire from around 485 B.C., to somewhere around 465 B.C. There was a 20 or 21 year reign. At the time of Esther, he is three years into his reign. And being the king of Persia, there is no more powerful man on the face of the planet than King Ahasuerus. King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, has a queen. She's the second character in the story, a queen named Vashti. Some pronounce it Vashti. It really doesn't matter, I don't think. She won't fuss much. But we're introduced to her a few verses later here after we're being told about uh, not just one big banquet that the king throws, but two of them. In fact, get this. The king throws a banquet. We'll call it a banquet. It was just a huge party. A 180-day celebration. Can you imagine that? 180 days of celebration for the king, his officials, nobles, all of his governors and and government officials. They all come together and they have this huge celebration for 180 days. The military leaders, everybody was there. And then it was followed by a seven-day celebration for everyone in the kingdom complete with all the food, all the wine, and all the entertainment that the kingdom could possibly offer at the time. Just, again, as a sidebar here, this was mostly just to puff up the king himself, to glorify him. That's another story for another day. But during all this time, Queen Vashti, she also gave a party for herself and all of the women who served in the palace. And Other than that, we really don't know a lot about her except to say that apparently she was a very strong-willed, independent kind of a woman. She didn't take very kindly to being objectified, which I don't think any of you ladies would, nor should you. Because we read in the first chapter that after all the the king and all of his officials were well into this 180-day celebration. It says they were high in spirits. What do you think that means? I mean, man, they were 14 sheets to the wind, right? Well, here's what the king commanded his servants in verse 11 of chapter 1. To bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown. Notice that it didn't say she was to wear anything else. We don't know. Maybe just the crown. So in order to display her beauty to the people and the nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Now just so you know, this is pretty much the last time we see Queen Vashti. She's on her way out. She has displeased and she has angered the king. And so all of his nobles, his officials and counselors advise him, you need to replace her. 
we, we've got a problem here. And so they begin the process of doing just that. Why? Just because she refused to come? Just because the king got angry? No, get this. Here, this is guy thinking for you, okay? All these guys, they huddle up in a room and they say, Listen, king, this is bad news. We can't have this. If, the queen, if news gets out that the queen was insubordinate and refused to obey your command, what if all our wives start doing that? Like word's going to get out and spread around the entire kingdom and everybody's wives are going to be defiant. And we certainly can't have that. So she's out. And the process begins to find her replacement, which ultimately would be our third and most central character of the story. And that's a woman of inner and outer beauty named Esther. Esther's a Jew who's living in exile in Persia. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah. It means a, a myrtle tree or a branch. But she's given the Persian name Esther, which interesting enough means star. And she certainly lives up to that name. She is the star of the show. She was an, she was an orphan early on in her life, raised by her cousin and we'll meet him in just a moment. But we're told in Esther chapter 2 that she was absolutely gorgeous. It says Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah whom he brought up because she had neither father or mother. This young woman who was also known as Esther had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Just a question for you. How does, how does a, a young girl who is orphaned somehow become queen of Persia. You would think that's an impossibility, that those kinds of things just don't seem to happen. Well, I mean, how else than a beauty pageant, right? And, and that's exactly what happens. A, a huge pageant, basically, was, was thrown to find the, the king a new queen. It comes on the heels of a ego-defeating military loss. Now, Persia was the, was the world-dominant power at the time. But even being the world power, sometimes your perceived strength and might can get ahead of you. And so King Xerxes, Ahasuerus, he decided he was going to invade Greece. Well, I think he went in with a little too much arrogance and a little too uh, less of preparation. And, well, long story short, Greece handed his tail to him. And so he went back home defeated, depressed. He's down and out, and he has no queen to comfort him, to console him. You know, he has no one to sort of fill this void and so we find here in chapter 2, verse 8, the king had ordered an edict. It had been proclaimed throughout the providence. It says, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Now, think about this. Word is sent out over the 127 provinces ruled by Persia looking for a new queen. The historian Josephus says that it was upwards of 400 women that were brought to the capital. To participate. And it says, Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. Esther then caught the eye and the attention of all the king's officials and was given preferential treatment. And so when her time was come to go before the king, her name was drawn. It says in verse 17 that the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. This is chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. 
from orphan Esther to Queen Esther with your own holiday. I mean, how incredible is that? One important note here. Take this bit of information and just store it in the back of your mind for a few minutes. No one knows yet that Esther is Jewish. That'll play a huge part in the story. Our fourth character we've already mentioned already in passing is a godly Jew named Mordecai. As I said, this is Esther's cousin who took her in. He raised her after her parents had died. We don't know the circumstances surrounding that. We have no idea what happened to them. But he is apparently a man of of honor, of integrity, a man who has done his best to raise Esther as his own daughter in such a way as to please the Lord. And once she becomes queen, Mordecai, just like I mean, any dad would understand this, he doesn't just let her go and hope all things go well, but it says that Mordecai begins to hang out in front of the king's gate. I mean, who wouldn't do that? You know, I want to keep tabs on my daughter. I want to see what's going on. I want to make sure every day that she's okay. If I can do anything for her, just I, I need to be in the know. And so he's hanging out by the king's gate. And he overhears something very disturbing. Look at verse 21 in chapter 2. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. Now, in exile or not, we see Mordecai modeling godliness, character, integrity. He honors the king by literally saving his life. We already know that the king was informed of who sort of foiled this plot. And you would think that there would be, I mean, this is a king of parties. 180-day party, 7-day party, give Esther a, a holiday all to herself. You would think he would throw a party for Mordecai. Nothing. It all gets lost, somehow overlooked. And the story quickly jumps to the promotion of our fifth character who's unmentioned, unknown until this time in the story. And that's a wicked officer named Haman. Haman was one of the king's officials who was promoted very quickly to second in command. He becomes, of of a sorts, the prime minister of Persia. The problem with Haman is he is as full of pride and arrogance as any individual could possibly be. He is wicked and corrupt through and through. It says that when he entered and exited the king's gates, that the guards, responding to expectation, I presume, bowed in honor of him. And that expectation not only uh, was present there at the king's gate, but inside the palace, outside in the streets. Everywhere Haman went, he expected people to honor him, to submit and, and bow to him. But Mordecai, remember, a God-honoring man, a God-fearing man, he refused to bow his knee to such a man as Haman. Of course, a guy like this, it's filled with such arrogance, it infuriates him. He is enraged every time he sees Mordecai and his defiance. And so, as a way to seek sort of his his vengeance out on Mordecai, he not only plots to kill Mordecai, but he takes it a step further. And he devises a scheme to annihilate the entire race of Jews. 
within the Persian kingdom. He deceives the king into signing an edict that on a certain day, vengeance, judgment would be spelled out on the Jewish people and completely wipe them off the face of the earth. Well, Mordecai learns of Haman's plans, and who do you think he tells? Come on now. Esther, yeah, I mean, you've got a direct connection to the king. Why wouldn't you? So he tells Esther. But what is it about Esther that nobody knows? She's Jewish. She's in a difficult spot. Mordecai sends this message to Esther. And he says, Esther, you've got to do something about this. Like you're, you're our only hope. You know, perhaps God has chosen you. This is a part of His plan for your life. And part of this message that Mordecai sends to her is, is the driving theme of the book. It is the theme verse of the book. It drives home the very message that we're trying to get across this morning, that God has chosen, not only Esther, but God has chosen us. For a very specific purpose. The theme verse, and this would be the one you would want to highlight, if any, in the entire story of Esther, is Esther chapter 4, verse 14. I'm going to read it in context because I want you to know what it's talking about. Well, she gets this message and she's reluctant to just barge into the king's presence. She says to Mordecai, listen, I've not been invited to see the king in over 30 days. It's been a month since we've even spoken. I can't just rush into his presence without being uh, summoned. That would spell death, which it was. It was law. You don't just walk into the presence of the king, and if so, you could die. I mean, the only saving grace would be if he held out his scepter, basically saving your life. Here's how Mordecai responds. Chapter 4, verse 13. He sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And this is the theme phrase of the entire book. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, Esther, you were born for this. This is your time. This is your moment. And God has chosen you. And though she is the queen, man, such character here, Esther honors her father-like cousin, And she walks into the presence of the king. Not knowing if he would spare her life. Thankfully, he extends to her his scepter. And then he says, Esther, what is it? What do you want? Request anything. You, you've got it. Up to half the kingdom. I'm sure that's probably an exaggeration. But up to half the kingdom, it's yours. And she says, well, I've planned a, a banquet, you know, a little a dinner party. Just a small thing, just a private event. And I would like to invite you and, and your second in command. I would like to invite Haman. The two of you come and be my guest at my dinner party tomorrow. And, and then I would be glad to share with you what it is I would, what I would like so she has this plan that at the banquet, she is going to reveal Haman's scheme. Turns out there's two such banquets. There's two dinner parties, consecutive, one right after the other. Because at the first, for whatever reason, she chooses to remain silent. But at the second one, she gathers herself. She finds the courage to tell the king about Haman's plot to exterminate the Jews. 
she reveals to him how Haman had deceived the king into ordering this edict that would call for the massacre of her people, including herself. Now, I want to jump to the end of the story so that we have time to make the connection between this story and our story. So, what happens is obviously the king is infuriated. He is enraged at deception. And get this, he orders Haman to be impaled on the very gallows that he had had built for Mordecai. He had had plans to kill one, but he ends up the one being impaled And guess who is promoted to second in command? Who's the new prime minister of Persia? Mordecai. Wow, think about that. And as the old saying goes, everybody lived happily ever after. Well, at least for a little while they did. What does that have to do with us? Is there anything that God is teaching us through the story of Esther? You know, when we read this, and I I really hope you'll spend time this week doing so when we read the story of Esther it's easy for us to admire her story while at the same time discounting ours we believe the lie that God chooses some people like Esther like Mordecai Paul or as a more present day example, Billy Graham, you know, someone like that. That God chooses some, but He doesn't choose me. How could He? Why would He? What do I have to offer? We believe the lie that God somehow doesn't have great and unimaginable plans for me, for you. You add to that, ladies. I know that the story of Esther with many of you has a a very special place. You add to that, ladies, the overwhelming pressure, the onslaught of messaging that you get day in and day out, be it on TV or through social media, that you have to be a certain thing or look a certain way to measure up. Listen, all that's not, it's, it's all false. It's not true. The Bible tells us, That God can and God has chosen us, every single one of us, for greatness and for godliness. Listen to what Jesus said in John 15, verse 16. He said, you did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Jesus says, I have chosen you. And I have plans for you that include greatness. Things that will make a difference for many years to come. Here's how Paul said it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For He, God, chose us in Him, in Christ. Before, listen, not before you were born, but for the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. And then you have 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It's a paraphrase of our memory verse from Deuteronomy. Peter says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Don't let this truth escape you. God has chosen you, not only because He loves you and He wants a relationship with you. Of course He does. And I am thankful for that every single day. But God has chosen us because He has a specific plan and purpose for our lives. And so as you read the story of Esther this week, I want you to think about that. The plans that God has for you, just like the plans God had for Esther. Who would have ever thought? I'm sure she never thought, one day I'm going to grow up to be the queen. But listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 20. To him 
who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. According to His power that is at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Did you get what Paul was saying right there? That God is able and He has already thought through plans that you've not even yet imagined. You cannot even conceive the greatness that God knows that you're capable of as He works through you. Let that sink in. And again, as you read this story this week, as easy as it is to sometimes think how and why God would choose us, God would choose me. Listen, that's why the story of Esther is so encouraging. And so, just real quick, I'm going to leave you with three truths that the story of Esther teaches us. And I want you to meditate on these things. I want you to really concentrate on these truths this week as you read this story. The first one is this. The story of Esther teaches us that God's plans are not hindered by humanity. Think back to the story. King Ahasuerus... King Xerxes, whatever you want to call him. He, he thought he was literally the king of the world. I mean, in a way, he was right. There was no one on earth more powerful than him. Archaeological excavations of this time period unearthed inscriptions in which the king refers to himself, and quoting here, as the great king, the king of kings. And the king of this great earth, ruler of the world. And then you have Haman, his prime minister. Haman believed that he had the power, the might, the authority to annihilate an entire group of people from the earth. Like by his own word, just with the with the flick of his wrist, he could just rid the earth of people that he didn't like. He had a deep-seated hatred of the Jewish people. It didn't start with Mordecai. We're told in the story that Haman was an Agagite. That means he was a descendant of King Agag. King Agag was the king of the Amalekites that you might remember back in the story when uh, King Saul, the first king of Israel, he is told by God, you go in and you defeat these people. Not only just defeat them, but wipe them out, including the king. But Saul disobeyed and he spared Agag. Well, that's coming home to roost they have become just fierce and long-standing arch enemies. And this is where this is coming from. And now he has his opportunity to seek out his revenge. But what he doesn't realize is that Xerxes, Haman, you come up to you know, present-day history, whether it be somebody like Adolf Hitler, or some present evil around the world that's committing genocide, or, or just your own personal adversary. They're no match for God. There's no one among humanity that can hinder or stop God's plan for your life and the purpose that He created you for. Even the own enemy of your soul cannot stop. The God of heaven. He has a plan for you in your life that will not be hindered by anyone. You might say, well, wait a minute. What about me? Like, what about my own ability to seemingly, you know, ruin everything that I touch in life? The second truth is this, that God's purposes are not frustrated by failure. We can somewhat 
believe that God's plans can't be stopped by others. But what if I mess it up? What if my own failures get in the way? Again, think about what happened with Esther. When she first approached the king, he asked her just flat out, what, do you, what is it that you want? What's your request? Again, anything you ask, I'll do it. It's yours. Just name it. And there standing in front of the king, she says, uh, well, uh, I got a dinner party tomorrow. How about you come to that? That's what I want. Oh, great. We'd love to be your guest. He and Haman come to the party. They're sitting around, you know, making small talk. And the king again, Esther, what's on your mind? What do you, what are you thinking about? Is there something that you want? Again, whatever it is, just ask. It, it's yours. I'll hold back nothing. Well... What's, what's tomorrow looking like for you? I mean, could you come back tomorrow night for another dinner, just the, just the two of you? You see, she keeps putting, pushing off to later, perhaps what she should do right now. Now, some would argue that it was a calculated move. Some might argue that she's scared. She was missing her opportunity. She was, she was procrastinating. She was pushing it off. To a later time. Thankfully, um, even though she remained silent those first two times at the second banquet, she finally did expose Haman's demonic plan. But the fact is, what we learn in the story, that God was going to save his people one way or another. Either Esther was going to be a willing participant in the plan of God for her life, or God would move on without her. Because Mordecai said, chapter 4, verse 14, If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Esther, your failure will not stop God. No one else can, including you. So decide today whether or not you are going to participate in the plan of God. Because what God's going to do, He's going to do, with or without you. Like, your failures might stop you, but it's not going to stop Him. He's invited you to come along. It's sort of like, you know, the bus is moving, you can get on or you can get off, but it's not stopping like, we're going. This is going to happen. Thankfully, Esther didn't allow, whether it was her fear, her failures, her insecurities, whatever it might have been, it didn't keep her down. Instead, she secured her place in history, her place in Scripture, which is amazing in and of itself. Think about it. A young woman like this with her kind of background, her upbringing, and as we hear all the time these days, I hear this day in and day out till it makes my head want to explode. We are fed this lie every single day that, just, that there are some people that just because they were born into be it a certain family or a certain part of the city or in certain conditions that they cannot have success. They cannot experience success or they don't have the same opportunities. It's just not true. Because here's the truth that the scripture teaches. Number three, God's people are not disqualified by disadvantage or difficulty. God has a plan and a purpose for you. Your background, your upbringing, your circumstances will not stand in the way. He is capable of anything. There were plenty of reasons that anybody could point to as to why Esther and Mordecai could not have or should not have achieved what they did. You have the fact that they're Jewish, exiles, likely poor. She's orphaned. And did you notice that Mordecai's wife isn't mentioned in the story? 
Maybe you didn't, but you will when you read it. So does that mean he was a single dad? All of these disadvantages, all of these difficulties, and the list just goes on and on and on, but the overarching message is that God is greater. God is greater than than what we or anyone else sees as a difficult situation or obstacles or determining factors, disadvantage. Nothing, nothing will prevent him from using and working through his people to accomplish his plan and his purpose around the world. Not then, not now, and not ever. The question is, Not will God choose us. He already has. Will we choose Him? Will we choose to be a part of God's plan for our life? Or will we simply be spectators of what we should be participators? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe today is the first day that you realize that Man, God really is interested in me. God really does have a plan for me. He loves me. He values me as a treasured possession. Perhaps that's just occurring to you. I would invite you right now to respond to that truth and invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. If you've never done that, right now, right where you sit, Have a private conversation between you and the creator of the universe. And say to him, Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And that your blood purifies and cleanses me inside and out. And through faith in you, heaven will be my eternal home. I receive you now as my Lord and Savior. And I long to experience the great and unimaginable plans that you have for me. If you're praying that prayer today to invite Jesus into your life this morning for the very first time, again, while nobody's looking around, would you just do me a favor and just slip up your hand so I know who who to be praying for real quick. Real quick, is there anybody? I'm trusting that you've made that decision. That you have secured your eternal home through faith in Jesus. But what about the here and now? What about this life? What things are you going to accomplish? What difference are you going to make in this world and in eternity? Have you given that much thought? Or have you believed the lie? That you've already gone too far, messed up too many times. Have you already discredited and disqualified yourself? Have you believed what someone told you years ago that you'll never amount to anything? Listen to me. Stop believing those lies. Those are absolutely falsehoods coming from nowhere other than the pit of hell and Satan himself. God has greatness in your future. God has godliness in your future. He has things in store for you that you could not even possibly conceive. Would you trust him and yield yourself to him so that he might bring those things to pass? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you with submitted hearts and submitted lives. Whether we've believed the lie that we're just not good enough or that we've told ourselves that we're in charge. Today we we give up all of that. We're not going to believe those things anymore, but we're going to trust that your plans for us are far greater than anything we could possibly plan for ourselves and we're going to believe that by your power at work within us that we will go on from here to accomplish things that are just absolutely 
unthinkable. Not for our glory, Lord, but for yours and yours alone. May you be made famous in the church and throughout the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week, guys.